Hi, I'm Kristen, and this is the Simple Handmade Everyday Podcast, where I talk about living a creative, intentional life. I like to chat about quilting, sometimes knitting, what I'm reading and watching, and a little bit about keeping a cozy, organized home. I've got my cup of tea in hand, so let's settle in for a chat. This is episode 65. Hey friends, happy Valentine's Day, although... It probably won't be Valentine's Day when most of you listen to this, but still, I retroactively wish you a happy Valentine's Day. Um, I hope that you are snuggled in today or doing something fun while you listen um, and that you have a lovely beverage. I've got my cup of tea here that um, it's not actually my thing. I thought I would try something new today so that I would just get off my normal Harney and Sons. So for Christmas, I gave my daughter a combo pack of Twinings tea and it had a lot of lovely um, teas in there. She really likes the chai. There was something called the Christmas blend that a reader had, had recommended, um, which is, I actually was going to go buy that when I saw this combo pack and I went, okay, I'm gonna do that instead. But I am drinking something today called Gingerbread Joy, which is uh, black tea with ginger and cinnamon. And I'm not really a flavored tea person, but if you are, um, you might really like this. It actually reminds me of that, um, oh, what is the brand? Yorkshire. They have this um, biscuit tea, which is supposed to taste a little bit like you've got a, had a cookie in your tea. Um, and that's what it reminds me of, but it's okay. It's not my very favorite, but not into the flavored tea so much. So how is the weather where you are? We had some actual weather. It's now been a couple of weeks ago where there was snow up in the mountains in Southern California. Actually, there was even some snow around where I was, not exactly where I was. Um, When I was a kid, it snowed twice in my life. Actually, I was like 13 once and then more like 23. So not exactly a kid. Um, But I saw it based on that. I thought it basically snows like every 10 years and I told my kids that and it has never snowed here in their whole lifetime so that was wrong Um, but everything is just a little bit warmer so it just doesn't happen but apparently it snowed a little bit in Malibu (laughs) and then in the town um, next to where I am a town called Camarillo um, my best friend lives there and I asked her if it snowed there because I'd seen pictures of it snowing and she said no it didn't snow where she was but you know a mile away at her parents house it had at least hailed which we might here in Southern California consider snow. (laughs) But anyway, so we made the plan to go to Fraser Park to go up into the Los Padres National Forest to go just play in the snow. We borrowed some sleds and and stuff. And we haven't been there for years um, because when the kids were little, just getting the the right clothes for them, you know, we we had to borrow. We're not gonna buy snow clothes so that they could go to the snow once. But anyways, we did actually this time, now that everyone's pretty much full grown, um, made the investment in some good, um, uh, what are they called? Gloves, snow, you know, snow gloves and, you know, various things. We don't even have beanies in this house. (laughs) But anyway, so we did that. Uh, We went and bought chains for the car, the whole deal. And then we got up on that morning to go. It was like probably two weeks ago and all the roads were closed to get to where we were going. So that was a big disappointment. And then we saw that there was a a warm week ahead and that maybe it was all gonna melt. Um, But we did wait and we went the next week and and you can um, get on the website and look at these cameras that are posted around uh, like Cuddy Valley and stuff where we were gonna go and you could see that the snow was melting, but we're like, you know what, it's Sunday. Um, What what else are we gonna do here today? Let's just go. So we did. and we found the snow and it was so much fun. It was great. Um, it was sledding. I did not sled. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but I sprained my wrist. I guess it's three weeks ago now. And I was never so aware of the chance of falling and using my hand (laughs) to stop my fall as I was, as I was traipsing around the snow. And so I did not go sledding, but everyone else did. It was, it was fun. I actually learned to carry, um, Anything I was carrying, I would carry in my hand with the um, that was with the sprained wrist, so that if I did trip and fall, which I did many times, just stumble in the snow. The snow was like up to our knees in some places. That I would automatically put my other hand down to to stop myself. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's just so it's so fun. It's so rare for us around here to really see some snow. So so that was really fun. Um, and other than that, you know, life is just continuing on. <laughs> I have my friends, you know, they check in with me on text. How, how's it, 
what's going on? You know, how are you? And it's just like, same, same. Everything's the same all the time. But, uh, but there's, I feel like there's a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel here in February of 2021. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different um, today. I'm going to, I, on the Simple Handmade Everyday Facebook group, I asked for um, questions. I thought I'd do a little Q&A thing. We did it a few months ago and it was fun. And uh, so I'm going to do that again at the end of the podcast where I would normally do my homemaking or productivity segment. So if you're not interested in that, that will be the time for you to just uh, move on. (laughs) Before we get into the quilting segment, I wanted to thank the Fat Quarter Shop for being the awesome sponsors that they are. Fat Quarter Shop is a one-stop show for quilting fabrics and supplies for quilters around the world. They stock quilt shop quality fabrics, pre-cuts, quilt kits, patterns, notions, and even cross-stitch supplies. This month, their special is that you can get 20% off of Motabella solids. These are my favorite solids to use. They're my favorite solids and background fabrics. They have that amazing mode of quality with very little fraying, which um, is often a problem with background fabrics and solids as I've, I've noticed, and super important when you're doing something like hand piecing where you're handling that fabric a lot. I'm using Motabella solids as my background fabric for the Harmony quilt for the hand piece quilt along, and I'm loving it. I'll put a link in the show notes. Let's talk quilting. Well, as it's been for the last few months, my, my main pro- project for quilting has been the Harmony quilt, which is our pattern for the handpiece quilt along that Patty from Elm Street Quilt and I are hosting. And we're really getting down to it now. Um, the pattern has been released. And today, if you happen to listen to this on the 14th, today is the last day to buy the pattern and automatically be entered in our bonus giveaway. I mean, obviously you can buy the pattern whenever you want, but everyone who buys it before February 14th um, is entered in a bonus giveaway for what I'm calling a hand piecing starter pack. It's got this cute, um, kind of a recycled material zipper pouch from CNT Publishing. And it's got the my very favorite um, Fomore Easy Snips that are like kind of spring loaded, so nice. And have they're a little bit the blades are a little bit curved. I love them so much. And um, a spool of 80 weight Orifil thread, my favorite thread for hand piecing. You can use whatever you want, but 80 is the higher the number on. Um, thread the thinner it is so 80 weight is thinner than your normal 50 weight which is your normal sewing weight thread which works just fine but I love 80 weight it hardly takes up any space in your seam allowance super nice and um, the Ginny Byers perfect piecer which is so great for um, marking sewing lines of course you can always just use any um, sort of a, a ruler to mark a quarter inch line but the perfect piecer is the right size it gives you options for uh, making a solid line or sewing dot to dot it's got all, the, got all the angles on it it's great it is like my one of my most beloved sewing notions and speaking of which tomorrow on the 15th patty and i are both um publishing blog posts about our favorite hand piecing sewing notions and actually um you know Besides the perfect piecer, all of them are just favorite sewing notions in general. So you might want to check that out too if you listen to this later. So the hand piece quilts along starts on February 22nd. So at this point, people have downloaded the pattern. They're sharing their fabric pulls. They're sharing their coloring pages and um, changing their mind and giving each other feedback in, the, in our hand piece quilts along Facebook group. So um, it's just so fun to be a part of this like worldwide movement of people who are all going back to basics and, and hand sewing. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, working with your hands is so good for your brain during times of stress and we're in the middle of a pandemic hopefully we are in the end part of a pandemic i don't know but nonetheless we all could use a little bit of of peace of mind so um patty before we even um launched the pattern patty had hers done and quilted and bound and it's beautiful i did not um i the the pattern uh is for a 28 inch block it's beautiful that um is fine on its own like it's a it's a wall hanging size but you put four of them together and it's this great size throw quilt and so um i had three of the four uh of the big blocks done so i i was able to show mine for the pattern release and then as i was sewing my fourth quill my fourth block that's when i sprained my wrist and i could not hand sew i'm back to doing that now and um so I'm, I'm just about getting ready to sew the all four blocks together i love it don't you love it the kind of the 
it feels like almost like a victory lap when you're just doing those last long seams to sew your rows together. So I'm almost there. And Patty quilted hers with a, she machine quilted hers with a spiral quilt, a spiral design starting at the middle. And because there's this cool secondary um, optical illusion of curves, there's a secondary pattern, the, that quilting complements it so beautifully. And uh, I am totally, my plan is to totally just rip that off from her, <laughs> just take that idea and run with it and do mine that way too. Um, and I know that it takes a long time and it's, it's a little bit tedious, but um, yeah, I've got to figure out a way to get the, uh, the sewing machine set up at a place where I can leave it. My sewing situation does not allow for that very well right now, but I think I'm going to just do it at the kitchen table and then and just end and it's, it's always when you stop and start again that you, there's a risk of a little jag but you know what I have kind of learned over time that once you wash a quilt and you're using stuff you never see those little imperfections in quilting that are so glaringly obvious to you when you're doing it also um, I've given up being such a ridiculous perfectionist about all my points and things like that you just don't notice that when you use the quilt and that is the point the point is to enjoy the process of making the quilt and then to enjoy it for its utility or beauty if it's just hanging up but you are never is critical um, of the the actual uh, technique of it as you are when you were you know six inches away staring it in the face so let it go I think I um I've talked about this before I heard Mr. Do Mr. Domestic say one thing and then someone even um uh changed it a little bit he said he shoots for 80 percent perfection that last 20 percent no, no no he says 90 percent 90 percent perfection and that last 10% just steals your joy. And um, and then I was talking to uh, Cheryl Brinkley. She's Metal Miss Designs. I, was, I talked to her at a quilt con one time. And she said she's a patent designer. Not she's not a patent designer. She is an engineer that examines patent designs or something like that. And so anyway, so like, you know, very technical. But she's like, I would say 80%. Go for 80%. <laughs> perfection that last 20 percent will kill you so I've, I've kind of tried to change my ways because of that but after all this hand sewing I'm getting the the itch to make a machine piece quilt and it's going to feel so fast to put something like that together at this point um, but uh, I need to stay monogamous until I am completely done with this quilt but I have been thinking about it I've also just been thinking about sewing for my home I've been digging into some simple living books and just being reminded of um i don't know how rewarding it is to to keep and maintain your home well and uh, i've been thinking of how i would like to um maybe make some uh, napkins we use cloth napkins and we use them all the time but some of them are getting pretty old and stained and the reason i've never really done it before is i feel like cloth napkins that you buy are a thicker cotton than quilting cotton um so, and you know, they just have like a, that rolled hem, like a mitered with a mitered corner, which I could figure out how to do. Um, that's kind of my least favorite sewing that ironing, you know, turning something up a quarter inch and then folding it over and ironing it again. I feel like I always burn my fingers, but there's also those rolled hem sewing machine feet. And I think I have one of those. Um, so I need to, to figure that out. So I don't know if I need to go two pieces of quilting cotton in a, you know, squares together, sandwiched. And, um, and then that would be thick enough. I'm not sure. If you've ever made napkins and you're happy with the quality of them, let me know. Um, I've also been thinking about making some more neutral, kind of maybe linen um, placemats. We use placemats. Um, so I don't know, just things like that for my home. Um, I'm, it's to the point now where I probably need to knit up some more dishcloths. But I love reaching for those things um, when I'm just, you know, in my home doing things, that knowing that they're homemade. Um, I have all these flour sack tea towels, which I don't know how people use those to dry dishes and whatnot, but I use them to dry vegetables and lettuce. I'll put them in these big tea towels, go them outside and like kind of spin them around. And those are ones that I've actually found at garage sales and um, I have embroidered the corner of them. So some of them actually have holes in them, but I, I feel like I just want to patch those up because <laughs> I don't want to get rid of it. And, and when it comes time to throw that towel out, I will absolutely cut that patch out that I've embroidered and I will applique it onto something else. But uh, So that's kind of what I'm thinking about um, sewing-wise. I'm even kind of thinking about sewing some clothes. Again, I'm kind of obsessed with linen right now. Some linen pants, uh, maybe a couple simple tops. I don't know. All right, let's move on to books. 
And what I've been uh, reading and listening to that I want to share with you, well, true to form, I am always listening, re-listening to a Louise Penny book. And the I, I recently got library card just to more surrounding libraries and I'm finding the audiobooks for the Louise Penny Inspector Gamache series the ones that the my normal library doesn't have and the most recent one is Barrier Dead which is book five in um, that series and it really brought home to me that um, I always say that this series really gets going in the middle it's not even in the middle anymore because book 17 is coming out in August but I now know that the series really gets going in book five, which is called The Brutal Telling. And then book six called Barrier Dead, which is the one that I just listened to, is um, where the whole overarching narrative that's going to really continue for the next 10 plus books really gets going. And, um, And I'd forgotten how that all panned out. It's been so long since I read that book that it was so nice to have that reminder. So of course, I'm always listening to a Louise Penny. I've already pre-ordered the um, book that's coming out on August 24th, which is called The Madness of Crowds. It's book 17. I'll put links in the show notes for all of this so you don't have to remember. And then after I was done, I always like to have a book that I'm reading um, physically and then one that I'm listening to. And the book that I'm listening to now is A Tree Grows in Brooklyn which is a book from the 40s. And I've heard many times that it's that's people's favorite book, especially um, maybe like if people my age, like their mom's favorite book kind of a thing. And I think it's be, it's because it takes place in the 40s and it's in uh, takes place obviously in Brooklyn. And so many people really resonate with the characters. And I'm just at the beginning. Um, it, it's reminding me of... Um, and, and I shouldn't say this because it's really early days on that on that book. I'll have more on this next time. But it's reminding me of an Ann Patchett book where I feel like we're just kind of plopped, plopped down in the middle of um, this neighborhood, this poor neighborhood in Brooklyn. And um, we're following around this young girl. How old is she? Maybe 11. I'm not really sure. And um, and just what it's like to live at that time, to be poor, to live in these um, neighborhoods where there's a large Jewish population, a large Irish population, and they don't always get along. And it reminds me a little bit of reading Tom Sawyer that um, the way that, um, you know, she talks about, what, just the way that it talks about the ethnicity of, of these various populations is not something that would really fly anymore. But you just have to know that it, it was written in this time, in the 40s. So that's been that's been fun. Um you know, I do love my cozy mysteries. I would say that Louise Penny is not a cozy mystery. It's funny, the end of the Barrier Dead, there was a little interview with her and someone asked her, do you consider your, these cozy mysteries? And she said, oh, absolutely not. Um, and she said something that was so true. She's like, in some ways, the mystery is incidental. The mystery is just the device to get these people together, to visit Three Pines, to to get into their lives. And that exact, is exactly why I love these um, Louise Penny books because I just love being there and um, you know, it makes me make like a cafe au lait <laughs> you know just all those things that uh, are really fun in this book he keeps every in the afternoon he'll sit down to, to read this is Inspector Gamache with a scotch and a, mi- and a bowl of mixed nuts I swear I bought mixed nuts I don't drink scotch but I just thought that would seem like such a nice way to end the day um, so, but on to cozy mysteries. Um, last time I talked about the uh, the secret book and scone society, which are just very super lightweight um, cozy mysteries, and I read three of them. They're um, free if you're on Prime, and you just have to return them to. You can, you can have like ten books out on this free Prime thing, and um, and then s- uh, someone else recommended another writer. And I grabbed one of her books. Um, I can't remember her name right now, but um, there was one that was only like $1.99 or something. It was called uh, A Crafter Quilts a Crime. And it sounds like a lot of these books, this one's like the third in the series, and there's one that's more sort of yarn (laughs) related. But there's a a community craft shop, which makes me want to open a community craft shop where there's people who are, you know, there's quilters, there's knitters, there's soap makers, there's like everything all in this one, uh, like cooperative space. It sounds wonderful. Um, so I just finished that one yesterday. Um, and it was okay. I didn't love it, to be honest with you. I preferred the secret book and scone society. Um, there was just something about the writing style. Um, I noticed the writing, um, 
in that's kind of a deal killer for me. If I notice the writing, then I in in a the writing is not just sort of transparent to me, then that kind of bugs me. And there were just certain <laughs> phrases that I was like, why didn't an editor fix that? Like, or nobody would say that like that. That was just little things like that. But it was it was still a totally fun little uh, romp through this um, northeastern town during a snowstorm and, and, and all the things that happen. So um, that's what I've been listening to uh, or re- that was reading. And now I'm also, like I said, I'm into reading the Simple Living books. I'm rereading um, Down to Earth by Rhonda Hetzel, who um, has a blog called Down to Earth. And um, I just find her really inspiring. And, and, and there's nothing super special about, you know, she, about what she writes about, just how to really dig into your home, to make the most of it, to... Um, live way beneath your means so that um, so that frankly that you can work less and enjoy more of what you want to do so anyways I've been enjoying that as well it's got me really thinking about homemaking I do have a new show I want to talk to you about a co-worker recommended a uh, show on Netflix called Money Heist which was a show from Spain now I'm feeling like did I talk about this last podcast I'm just gonna put that aside and keep going it's a it's a show from Spain that was very popular and it was three seasons Um, Netflix bought it I think they went ahead and dubbed it and um, so it's in Spanish but there's a a voiceover Um, although we always seem to watch with the the closed captioning on which is funny because the closed captioning translation and the dub translation don't match which is interesting anyways um it got to be such a hit during quarantine here that netflix funded two more seasons at apparently a higher uh you know investment so the the whole thing production value is a little bit better we're not to those seasons yet um but it's a the original title is um the name of the show is like the house of paper um which is way better named than Money Heist. <laughs> but it's about a group of um, people with one mastermind called The Professor who put together this heist um, where they're going to go to the Mint, the Royal Mint. They're going to they, they're, they're gonna go on a day where there's a field trip and stuff. So they've got hostages and they're going to hold these hostages for 10 days while they print money, while they print like a billion euros or something or maybe it's multiple it's a lot of money I keep saying nobody should have a heist that lasts 10 days something is going to go wrong which of course it does Um, but the idea is that it's the perfect crime that they could print off nobody's going to get hurt we can print off all this money we'll get away we're set for life boom it's the perfect crime of course it's not the perfect crime (laughs) so um anyways um so that's been that's the show my husband and I are watching there is like a, a little sex and cussing in there so that's not your thing um steer steer clear of that but it is a very interesting story um and then last night my daughter is she she's into or used to be actually not so much now but used to be into anime and she wanted to rewatch this movie called your name that was an anime movie not normally into anime we liked all the studio ghibli stuff like i don't know if you have kids you've heard of probably howl's moving castle or ponyo or kiki's delivery service um we love those kind of anime movies um but this one was very interesting. This is an idea that these two teenagers um, that are, live in different part, one's in Tokyo, one's in outside of Tokyo. So of course, this is animated, so it's, it's anime. And they um, wake up one morning, kind of like a Freaky Friday thing, they're, where they're switched, um, except for they don't know each other. And, um, and they live far away. They've never met. But this just keeps happening. And um, so they start to leave notes and clues for each other to tell each other who they are so that when it happens again they can um, kind of start to try to unravel this mystery and um, there's kind of a cool twist in it which I don't want to give away but um, if you've got to anyway like teenagers or anything like that that's into anime um, it's on prime and it's called your name and that was pretty fun So I want to also know if you guys are still watching All Creatures Great and Small. I totally binged that. That's the new PBS masterpiece. And um, I read a bad review about it and it made me a little bit angry (laughs) because I think it is such a perfect feel-good show. It is like exactly what we needed here in the pandemic to um, just, it's just pure escapism, you know. So um, anyways, I've talked about that in other episodes, so I won't go into it, but um, I know that it's still coming out week after week. So I hope you guys are watching that. It's the same thing with This Is Us. Are you guys watching This Is Us? Oh my gosh. 
So before they took a little bit of a break, they, they've had some some issues with scheduling because of the pandemic. They, there's been slowdowns in production. But I think it was in December, there was one of the very best episodes ever, in my opinion, called Birth Mother, all about Randall. Every story about Randall is going to be the best story on This Is Us. And I just thought you could just can never, you know, this is going to be a hard episode to top. And they finally had the next episode, um, which was a, basically a Kevin episode. And of course, it did not top the Randall episode. It never does. <laughs> but um, th- this has been an interesting show to watch because they are filming um, it, during this pandemic. They they, it's reflecting that, that, that things are happening in a pandemic. People are wearing masks. There are issues with quarantining, um, which, you know, I'm not getting on any other show right now. And I, that'll be interesting um, when this is rerun in the future. Like, what will that be like? You know, we all have PTSD over, oh, my gosh, I don't want to see anything where people are wearing masks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so anyway, so that's kind of um, what I've been up to and some shows I'd like to recommend. All right, let's start with the Q&A. This is so fun. The first question is, um, is what happened to your wrist? <laughs> and um, ah, I sprained my wrist like three weeks ago. It sounds so silly that I'm embarrassed to even talk about it. But one of our children, I will not say which one, took a bath in our bathroom because we have the bigger tub. Not that it's a very big tub. And um, we have tile floor, you know, water on the floor. And I think I would have been okay except for the fact that I st- our bathtub and shower are separate from each other. And I stepped up on the bathtub to put something away, like to set it on the top of the shower. And when I stepped down with some momentum, there was water and my feet came right out from under me. And I obviously put my left wrist down to break my fall and um, was pretty sure I broke it. Um, it was it, it was not fun. And I thought I did a pretty good job on my tailbone too. But ultimately, it looks like it was just a sprain. And um, it's just taken a little longer to heal than I ever would have thought. We're three weeks out. Um, it's, not in a, it's not in a splint anymore. Honestly, I never went to the doctor because it was pretty clear it wasn't broken. And um, I'm just, you know, I'm still not back to, say, lifting weights. It, you know, like I, it, it's just even carrying a coffee cup in that foot. <laughs> And for any length of time across the kitchen into the family room is, um, you know, getting to the limits. It's just very weak. So, yeah, it, but it did make it so that I could not hand sew. I tried with the splint on after about a week um, to see if I could hand sew. But there's something about the way you hold your wrist, um, at least the way I hold my wrist to hold the fabric, to hold the work Um with just this tilt in my wrist that was just, you know, obviously straining what was probably a tendon or something that I strained there. So I just, I'm just back to that now, getting back to hand sewing. And that's really, really nice. Um, So that's that. Tell us more about your day job. What kind of marketing work do you do? Do you have a specific focus? Um, Yes. So I do marketing. Um, When I I, I went to school for marketing, I got a job right out of college with, um, well, actually as an internship in college that turned into my job that I had after college. And I worked there for 10 years and I work there again now. (laughs) So it is a company that I never really talk about it because it sounds so boring. It is a it is a software company that makes software for the manufacturing industry. My husband actually works for the company too. It's where we met. He he writes the software for it. And it is the software that controls machines that make stuff, that makes the all the, mis- the metal stuff, the metal stuff that's in your cars and your refrigerators and your the chair you're sitting in, all that kind of stuff, or the molds for all the plastic things you see around you. Um, so it is not a glamorous industry. I worked there for 10 years till I had kids, took about 15 years off. And when we got to the point where, um, you know, we bought a new car and people, the kids were, got braces and things like that. I was like, okay, we need a little more money. And I went back part-time, very part-time, like 10 hours a week. It was great. And just slid right back into the marketing department over there. And, um, and that was nine years ago. And um, there's been several buyouts of this um, company, of this product. And um, we just went through another one that's been very stressful of a, of a buyout. And, um, but somewhere along the line, I stopped working for the company. Um, I was always a contractor, but uh, that, that company stopped using contractors. And so what I do now is I actually do marketing for a group of people um, who all have their own companies that sell this product. It's one of those, you know, like very specialized software products that costs tens of thousands of dollars and people, their whole business is just selling this product. 
And um, they're often small businesses that have always wanted to do marketing, but never really knew how to do it, never had time. So I do that for them um, for like a flat monthly rate. We all band together to do this, um, to do all the same types of marketing activities. And I will say that I have never really loved marketing. Um, but what I do right now is actually very nice because I don't really think so much about the fact that I do marketing as that I help out small businesses with an area of their business that has always bothered them. And I can just take it off their plate and handle it for them. And they're very grateful and I make decent money at it. And that's what kind of gets me out of bed every day because I am an Enneagram type two. I am a helper. Um, and um, so that's, you know, it's all... you. It's all about how you you frame things, right? And I kind of didn't, I'm not sure marketing was the right field for me because I'm just not one that really wants to be forcing people to buy things they don't want. But, um, you know, this is, it's a, it's a product that is actually very good at what it does. And, but it's not even for me, it's about the product. It's about helping small businesses. So, um, and no, there's not a particular time of year that's busiest for us. It's just, um, it's just always. <laughs> Um, the next question is, what is your favorite color? And do you find your fabric choices reflect that? And my favorite color is definitely blue. And absolutely, I am drawn to blue quilts, blue and white quilts. I've made many. I had to stop myself from making a blue quilt for the Harmony Quilt Along. I had it all planned out. And I'm just like, you made a blue quilt last year for the Handpiece Quilt Along. You need to do something different, which is why I have this kind of raspberry and mustard and slate um, kind of color scheme going for this year's um, hand piece quilt along. Um, the next question is, um, I'd like to know how you manage your time. I seem to achieve a lot while running a household. Thank you. I don't always feel that way to be honest with you, but, um, I think that really what helps me is, well, number one, I'm a list maker and I am very governed by routines and I'm constantly writing these routines down and, and tweaking them. Um, and it starts with a morning routine. It's such a fly lady thing to say, but it starts with a morning routine where I give myself a little bit of time to read the news, do devotions, do a little bit of journaling and exercise and get a load of laundry in. So that's like, my, that, all of that happens before I start work. And um, so that way during the day I can, um, you know, throw that laundry into the, the dryer. And then when work is over, I can fold it and get it put away. Does it work like that? Always? No, but most of the time it does. Um, so having a really solid morning routine. And um, I also try to get, you know, I do take a lunch break and I try to get a few things done around the house there, maybe wash some dishes, straighten things up just so that, um, things, you know, so that the, the chaos, just always trying to keep the chaos at bay. Um, and, uh, and then in the afternoons, when I'm done with working, I like to take a break and do a little bit of sewing at that point, fold, I'll kind of give myself um, something that I have to do, like a chore, um, to, you know, like fold the laundry and put it away, then I'll reward myself with a little bit of sewing before we start um, you know, like the whole dinner prep. And here's the other thing is that I do not do all of this myself um, in terms of uh, like cleaning the house. Um, I do like to, I have a certain level of house cleaning that I want done every single week. At this point, the only thing that I do is that I dust and vacuum the master bedroom and I clean the master bathroom. Those are my jobs. And I clean the downstairs bathroom. I make the other kids do the other things. So um, there's a kid that um, dusts and sweeps the hardwoods. There's another kid that empties all the trash and vacuums and another kid that um, cleans the kitchen, like does the deep cleaning on the kitchen. And um, none of this for anybody, if you just sit down and really do it or stand up and really do it, takes longer than 30 minutes. And I figure, and then my husband does most of the outside stuff. Um, so... The fact is, is that like everyone's living in this house and so it's all of our responsibility. Everyone can put 
in 30 minutes a week so that this house is completely reset um, every week. And I think that is, is like really important, important. And then they also, the three kids share a bathroom and it is their job every weekend to clean that. They all have their own jobs and that bathroom has to get cleaned every weekend. So I don't do it all myself. And I'm a little bit sad for when um, everybody leaves and I'm going to have to clean the whole house myself again, because it's been a long time since I've really had to clean the whole house. Um, I also am not perfect at this, but in the afternoon, when after I've folded the laundry and stuff, is I try to do my 15 minutes of zone work, which is like 15 minutes of whatever zone we're in. Like that's the, this is, this is fly lady terminology. Say we're in the kitchen. I will spend 15 minutes a day um, doing something in there that's more in the deep cleaning, wiping out the refrigerator, wiping out the pantry, wiping down the cabinet fronts. Um, if it's if the zone is the living room, then I will do a, a better job. I will I will dust all the the uh, shutters and wash the windows. I'll vacuum out, flip the sofas, flip the cushions, but just 15 minutes. And even if you just do it like two or three days a week, you're just slowly chipping away at every room of all those little things that bug you. So, um, so those are, that's, that's kind of my, my tip. And I always, if I, if I have a day, like on Saturdays where I really try to get a lot of stuff done, then, um, I alternate. I will do, I will do like 45 minutes of the cleaning or whatever I need to do, then I'll give myself like 15 or 20 minutes to sew or read and just kind of alternate. Um, it's, that's kind of an Amish thing. You know, it's like, it's, it's all, the work's always going to be there. So do some of the work and then take a little bit of a break. Um, oh, and the last thing I guess I want to say about organization is that I've adopted this thing called the Sunday Basket, which is a system of, um, of batching all your household tasks, the the errands and the phone calls and the computer work and things like that. And then and you just throw, I've got definitely episodes about this and you can get on their website um, where you just basically, as every little piece of paper or whatever activity comes across your, your desk, you're just like, can this wait until Sunday? I actually do my Sunday basket on Saturdays, but, and you just throw them in your basket and then you sit down with it, you sort them like with like, and you sit down, you knock out all the computer stuff, all the, all the, um, any like things you need to enter if you're tracking your budget, if you want to do Amazon orders, if you need to check on a return, if you want to check your bank statements, you just sit there at the computer and you knock that out for 30 minutes and then it's done for the week as opposed to um, doing those things. It seems like you could, could just do those things during the week and you can, but but switching gears um, can cost you a lot of time. So you get on there to order something on Amazon. The next thing you know, you're on Facebook and then it's an hour later. So it just keeps those, um, those tasks together so that you can knock them out more efficiently. The next question is, um, how is intermittent fasting going? Yes, I didn't. I promise you I was going to keep you as my accountability group. Well, that didn't really work. Um, the intermittent fasting is actually going really well. Um, I started it last summer where, um, when we did that whole five day challenge with Dara. So, um, I, I made this commitment to do intermittent fasting, which for me was basically, um, a 16 hour fast, eight hours eating window, which would, um, we are usually done eating by about 7 PM. So that would take me to 11. Now I go to 12. So it's actually a 17 hour fast. Um, and at that same time, I also, um, stopped eating snacks. So I just ate lunch and dinner. And I lost like 11 pounds over, I don't know, uh, six to eight weeks. And it was great. And then I kind of slacked off on it for a bit um, and got a little sloppy with the fasting. And then it was hard to get back to the fasting. But since January, I'm back to the fasting. It's not hard anymore. I easily go until 12, 1230. So that part is good. The weight is not falling off, unfortunately. Um, but there are a lot of things that fasting does for you inside your body that you can't see um, that that are good. If you want more information on that, I think the best book on that is called The Obesity Code by Jason Fung. Um, my husband has adopted this lifestyle too. And of course with men, it's working very well for him to get off some pesky <laughs> pounds. Um, the, um, and I know the reason that I'm not losing weight the way I was is because I'm, I'm snacking. I'm not just doing the, the lunch and dinner. My meals are fine. It's the snacking is what gets me into trouble. And it's not even snacking on bad food. It's too much nuts and cheese, things like that. Um, if you are interested, I, I'm also very, you know, you can do this without any program or anything, but there is, um, on, uh, I've Facebook. And of course she has a website, something called the Galveston diet, which is put together by a woman, uh, Mary Claire Haver, 
who is um, in her early 50s. She's a doctor and she had trouble. Um, she gained some menopausal weight and she had trouble getting it off and she kind of uh, eat less, move more was not working for her. And um, that the advice she'd given her patients all those years, she's realizing this is not really working anymore. And so she put together a, a plan and, and I, um, I like a plan. So I actually purchased that program, even though in many ways I had already known a lot of this stuff, but her um, plan focuses around intermittent fasting um, eating non-inflammatory foods and staying away from inflammatory foods. Inflammatory foods are sugar, white flour, white rice, things like that. And non-inflammatory foods, um, is this is surprising to no one, are basically fruits and vegetables and a moderate amount of protein. <laughs> um, and um, the other, there's three pillars of her program, intermittent fasting, non, you know, managing your inflammatory and non-inflammatory foods. And the last one is managing your macros, which is um, AKA staying pretty low carb um, because most of the carbs um, are, are your inflammatory foods. So, you know, higher fat, lower carb. It's not keto though, um, or anything like that. So anyways, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, if you just follow her Facebook page, um, she just, she talks about this constantly so with all these free videos, the, the package, which was, is not expensive. It was like $50 or something. And it, it just puts it all together with all the research and all the videos in one place so that, in meal plans and things like that, so that you can, um, kind of see it all together. So, um, she, all, uh, she also wants to know whether I have a crock pot or an air fryer. Um, I do have a crock pot. I do not have an air fryer, although I'm mildly interested. I do have an instant pot. And the truth is, is my husband does not like crock pot, crock pot meals. You know, there's this thing that sort of all taste alike. Um, so I don't use a crock pot very often. The only thing I really like uh, that for now I use the, the instant pot for is um is is cooking uh, chicken okay so here's the deal i have an instant pot i do not make full instant pot meals like i thought i would because again um it turns out they're not really the types of meals that i want to eat which are a lot of kind of stewy things but i would not give up my instant pot for the world for this these reasons one hard-boiled eggs they're actually steamed uh, if you cook them in an instant pot you can do a bunch at once and the shells peel off like nothing, like, you know, <sighs> with one hand, you can just, just take them off. They slip right out. And we eat a lot of hard boiled eggs. So that, that is so perfect for that. It is a great rice cooker. Um, so I use it for that. And um, there are a few things that I do in it. Like um, I make this, uh, this chicken, uh, chicken tacos, and you can put frozen chicken in there with some seasonings and, um, in 20 minutes, they're just done, which is really nice. But, um, really the, the, the eggs and rice are, are kind of worth it for me. And I pull the thing out cause we eat both of those things a lot, even, you know, brown rice for me, white rice for, for other people in my family. All right. This is taking longer than I thought it would. Cause you know, I could just talk and talk. Um, I'm going to just answer one more question today because I've got the list here and I will answer the other ones next time. So, um, the next question is what are some of your favorite YouTube sites for quilting and other things? And, um, so this just sounds like a fun question to answer. And I kind of went through what I, my page to figure it out. And here, here's how this pans out. So for quilting, um, this is the perfect time to talk about, um, this new sewing channel from a friend of the podcast, Andra. So this, the YouTube channel is called Andra Makes, my sewing journey one vlog at a time. And she, um, it's a new channel and she's adorable and she's wonderful at this. So she does a lot of clothes sewing too, which is, you know, making me want to sew clothes a little bit, but she's got, she shares what she's making. Um, she's got a, a, uh, a video called My Sewing Plans Using a Thrift Store Find, just all kinds of fun things like that. So definitely check out Andra Makes. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched Just Get It Done Quilt. She is amazing. This woman, who, she just, she really knows how to quilt. She really knows the math. She knows how to um, just uh, improvise things, how to, um, she's one of those people that can figure out how to do something faster or more thrifty, things like that. My brain doesn't always work that way. So I really appreciate the fact that she's got all kinds of information on scrap quilts and all kinds of things. She's very inspirational. And the last one on um, quilting is A Quilting Life by Sherry McConnell. I've talked about her before. She's a moda designer. She's a, she's a fabric designer. She's a pattern designer. Um, she's got a podcast 
and she's a, a very prolific blogger and she has a great YouTube channel of just showing you how to do things and inspiring you with the things that she makes. For fitness, I've talked about this before, but Paula B has great workout videos that are just absolutely so doable and she's just like your cheerleader to keep you going and I've not been able to do those since I hurt my wrist and I'm going to try them again next week but since I wasn't able to do that sort of a weight training video I um, transi transitioned over to doing Pilates and the channel I like best for that is called A Balanced Life and she does very doable Pilates videos. I do this one that's just the be beginner's video. It's 10 minutes long, but man, did I feel it the first time that I, I did it in my core. So um, also the yoga with Adrian is, is pretty famous. I think everyone knows about that. But so, so those are my, my fitness channels. Um, I've kind of gotten into watching YouTube videos about style and makeup and skincare. I'll talk more about those on another podcast, but my favorite resources for that, <laughs> even though I don't take it as far as any of these people, they're all, these people are a little more aspirational to me. There's a channel called Hot and Flashy, <laughs> and she is obsessed with skincare which I will never do all the things that she does. But it has made me realize that my skincare routine has left something to be desired. And I've kind of upped it a little bit. And I think there's some, you know, results to that. Um, I'll talk about that another time, but hot and flashy. There's another one called Fabulous 50s. This woman's Australian and she's a little bit more um, kind of bomb Shelly. Um, her name is actually Shelly, um, but she has good information on clothes, on fitness, on makeup, on skincare. Um, so I, I appreciate those. And there's another one called um, Busby Style. And she's um, she's adorable and tiny and petite. It's everything that I am not. And she's in her 40s, not her 50s. Um, but she's got some really good information on um, on how to dress. She's, all, she's a fashion person. And I think what I've learned really um, mostly from her is is I took my measurements and really figured out what body shape I am. I always, I guess I always kind of knew I was a pair, but now I actually measured my shoulders versus my, versus my hips and, and understanding that with my body shape, these are, there are certain types of clothes that are going to look better on me. Things that um, broaden my shoulders a little bit and don't accentuate my hips a little bit. So I should not be wearing skinny jeans, for instance, because I, if things like um, straight uh, legs or even a boot cut balances out my shoulders versus my hips hips. Um, and I have kind of realized that some of the, the shirts that I feel better in have a little bit more going on around my shoulders, like a, a little, like a floppy sleeve. And you know what? In the, in the nineties, I was in late eighties and nineties, I was all about shoulder pads. <laughs> I put shoulder pads in everything. I put shoulder pads in t-shirts and, um, and I loved them. I always thought I always look better with shoulder pads. And now I know why. I never realized. I thought I just kind of liked the look. Um, and not that we're getting back to shoulder pads. I bet we will, though. But now I realize that that's why that worked. So anyway, so that's Busby style. I'll link these in the in the show notes. Um, for homemaking, I've got a few that I really like for just inspirational homemaking. A couple of them. Oh, always Diana Denmark, right? She's the lady that just really has made the fly lady. Um, method accessible to the masses. So she's she's a given. Um, so I also like uh, one called Farmhouse on Boone. I've shared a video of hers where she taught me to make sauerkraut. And she lives on a homestead. She is the kind of, has the life that I thought that I wanted. I don't. I don't want to really be in a homestead anymore. But it's fun to watch her. She um, Basically, she cooks every meal from scratch. And while, again, I don't really want to do that, it's fun to watch and be inspired and pick up some things from her. Same thing with a, a channel called Mary's Nest. Um, she's a woman. She's probably in her 50s or 60s, and she's really into cooking what I'm going to call traditional foods. Um, she also has a thing on kombucha and sauerkraut um, and other fermented foods. Um, she on sourdough. She just has all kinds of. It's it's completely a cooking channel for some just you know bone broth, just really solid, um, good homemade um, food and how to manage a pantry, things like that. Um, from 
other homemaking um, perspectives, cleaning videos and and kind of general life stuff. Um, I like the Daily Connoisseur and Faith and Flower. I've talked about them before. They are both into sort of the 10 item wardrobe and just, you know, kind of really digging into being a homemaker. So those are my homemaking inspiration channels. And I don't watch any of these all the time. It's just that, you know, I will pick and choose when I when I want to be inspired. And then the last category that I want to share with you is is what I would call the funny videos. Um, and you guys have probably seen, there's a, a, a channel called The Holderness Family. It's a man and his wife, and they've got two kids. And they, they've become kind of a big thing during the pandemic because they have so many funny videos. He's a great singer and songwriter, so he does a lot of parody videos, and they're just hilarious. Um, so I enjoy them. And then also Julie Nolke, and you may have come across one of hers, and I will link to the first one in the show notes. She became famous during the pandemic um, with a series of videos, and she's done four, which is explaining the pandemic to my past self. And this all started with uh, in about March or April, where she visits herself from January and basically tries to explain what's coming and it's hilarious. And she's done four of them and they just, I just love them. I just get such a kick out of them. So those are my, you know, my fun um, YouTube. You know, I've been trying to be off social media for the most part and, um, but uh, I do indulge in some YouTube. So um, I hope you uh, check some of those out and hopefully you'll find something that you enjoy. So before I wrap this up, this very long episode, I wanted to thank A Perry 61 for leaving a lovely review on Apple Podcasts. Um, I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. And again, if you uh, feel inspired, I love uh, when you guys leave reviews and ratings. It helps other people find the podcast. And, um, and feel free to share it with friends who you think might enjoy it. I hope that you guys have a lovely week and I will catch you next time. You can find me online at my blog, Simple Handmade Every Day, on Instagram at Kristen Esser. And please consider joining us over on the Simple Handmade Every Day Facebook group so that we can keep the conversation going.